So, um, Rian van, de, van den Berg is a research scientist at Google Brain in Amsterdam, uh, the Netherlands. Uh, she received her PhD in theoretical condensed matter physics in 2016 at the University of Amsterdam. And she was a postdoctoral researcher in machine learning at the University of Amsterdam with Professor Max Welling. Her research interests are in generative modeling, source compensation, variational inference, and normalizing flows, and in the intersection of machine learning and the physical sciences. Today, she will be talking about variational inference, BAEs, and normalizing flows. I'm excited to hear this talk. Thank you very much. Uh, so good morning, everyone, and um, thanks for having me. I'm very excited to, to give uh, this, uh, this short lecture. Um, so this in the next say 45 minutes that uh, i'm going to talk about uh, variational inference uh, variational autoencoders and normalizing flows and how they all sort of like tie together um so uh, as uh, martina already said i work at google brain in amsterdam uh, since maybe about two years um, and i've been working on uh, this topic among other things so i'm going to start by um say giving a super brief uh, introduction to variational inference um, so that I can later uh, introduce variational autoencoders. Um, then I'm going to um, talk about vari variational autoencoders and autoencoders uh, uh, first um, and how they are, can be used for generative models. And then I'll continue with normalizing flows and how they can be used to uh, basically increase the, the performance of variational autoencoders. And I'll end with a short uh, summary of how normalizing flows can actually be used as standalone generative models without variational autoencoders. Um, so we'll start with variational inference. And so there's many, uh, I mean, variational inference is fairly old already, and there's many uh, nice review papers on it. I specifically really like uh, the variational inference, uh, a review for statistician by David Bly and, and, and his, his colleagues. Um, and in that paper, they state that the goal of variational inference is to approximate the conditional density of latent variables given observed variables. So let's um, try to unpack that sentence a little bit. So imagine that we have observed data, which we'll here denote by uh, x. Um, and so we have x data points for n data points, x1 to xn. And let's imagine that we would know the sort of like generative model for this data. So we know the uh, a distribution p of z and x. Uh, which factorizes into p of uh, in, into p of z and uh, p of x given z, where x again are the observables and z is some latent variable that, what, that we don't observe, but we just use that we know that that is used to as another random variable to produce this data that we've observed. Now, uh, as I said, so z is the latent variable which we haven't observed, and x is the observed uh, um, random variable. Uh, what we now try to do in variational inference is zero mean and a hyperparameter sigma, which will be the standard deviation of this Gaussian. Um, then we'll have for each data point, a cluster assignment, and that is a latent variable. So we won't observe it, but we will sample it from a categorical distribution. And this latent variable will tell you uh, from which mixture component to sample the actual data. So, uh, and in this prior probability that we've, this prior distribution that we've set here, we've said that uh, without any prior knowledge, we'll say that there's an equal probability of sampling from any of the K mixtures. And then we'll produce N data points with this. So each, for each data point, we'll get one cluster assignment. And we'll say that the, uh, given all of the cluster means and given all of the cluster assignments, we can sample the data points X through a Gaussian, which is conditioned on the cluster assignment and the means. So over here, you can see that for each i, this z, which is a one hot vector, will pick out the corresponding mean mu k for which, from which the sample, uh, the, the the observed random variable x. And now, this so these three probability distributions together can be combined so that we have the joint probability distribution over the data which we observed. So all of these x's together are are sort of concatenated into large X. All of the uh, latent cluster assignments Z and the um, cluster means. So we know that now we have sort of like chosen a particular factorization for this uh, uh, Bayesian mixture of Gaussians. And now 
if we have observed a lot of data, what we would like to infer is actually the distribution over the um, cluster means and cluster assignments that would correspond to this uh, data. And now it turns out that this is actually intractable because if we would write this posterior as the joint divided by P of X, we would need access to this P of X, which is also called the evidence. And the evidence is intractable because the only way we can get X is by um, integrating out all of the mu's and by summing over all of the possible values of Z. And so this turns out to be intractable. So what we're going to try to do is approximately infer this posterior. And we're going to do that with approximate variational inference. So the way that works is that we're going to, in general, pick a family of distributions Q. So for instance, uh, an often used uh, strategy is to pick the family Q to be only uh, Gaussian distributions. And within that family of distributions, we're going to find the best approximate posterior Q such that it uh, uh, minimizes the uh, KL divergence between Q and the posterior that we were trying to um, obtain. Now, if we write out this um, KL divergence, we can see that we're actually sort of like going in circles because the whole reason why we wanted to have this approximate posterior is because we actually didn't know this posterior distribution P of Z given X. So you can see that here, right, if we want to write out this Kullback library divergence, we have this expectation with respect to Q and this term. And this one is problematic because we don't know P of Z given X. What we can do, however, is we can again write P of Z given X. So this true posterior in terms of the joint, which we do know, and the P of log P of X. And again, we don't know this term, but if we want to minimize this Kullback library diversion with respect to Q, we see that this is actually constant, right? So log of P of X does not depend on the approximate posterior. So what we can do instead is um, maximize an alternative objective, which is basically just minus these two terms, uh, which is sometimes called the uh, evidence lower bound. So we can maximize these two terms with respect to Q, and this will also in fact, minimize this Kullback library divergence uh, because the location of the minimum doesn't change because of this constant. So now instead of sort of like optimizing this intractable objective, we're going to optimize an objective that is tractable and which will ensure that we are actually going to find an approximate posterior. And so as I said, this is called an evidence lower bound. And the reason for that is that it actually lower bounds the evidence or the log evidence. So in the previous slide, I made a decomposition where you had the KL and the log of P of X. And if you reshuffle that a bit, you can show that log of P of X is equal to the KL between this approximate posterior and the true posterior, which we don't know, plus this evidence lower bound. And now this term is always largely equal to zero. So that means that the evidence lower bound is smaller or equal than the log P of X. So it's smaller or equal than the log of the evidence. Um, so if we optimize this objective, this, this evidence lower bound with respect to Q, so if we maximize it, we're actually doing, we're doing two things. We're ensuring that Q of Z approximates P of Z given X. And one way, another way of seeing that is, if this is inequality, the left-hand sign doesn't depend on X. So if I optimize, if I maximize this elbow, I have to necessarily minimize this term because the left-hand sign stays constant. And because we're doing that, because we're minimizing this term, we're actually making sure that this elbow becomes a tighter bound to this uh, log of uh, evidence. And we'll use that later when we're going to talk about um, uh, variational autoencoders. And now an often used strategy for this family of distributions for um, this approximate posterior is to make sure, is to assume that the um, uh, all latent variables are independent of each other. So imagine that this latent variable Z is a vector of size uh, M. Uh, then we're going to say that the distribution over this vector is actually factorized across all its elements. And each element, of course, could have potentially a different factor. So this is called mean field variational inference. Um, and if we were to do this for this Bayesian mixture of uh, Gaussians, which we had before, where we again had this distribution, prior distribution over cluster means, we had a prior distribution over cluster assignments, and we had then a conditional distribution of the data given these two uh, latent variables, um, where our goal was to sort of like infer this distribution of these latent variables mu, which are model parameters, and latent variables z, 
uh, per data point, then what we could do is if we pick here this distribution over mu and z, we could factorize it such that there's one particular factor for each mu k, which we can pick Gaussian for instance, and there's one particular factor for each zi that belongs to each data point uh, xi. So we just take a very simple uh, assumption here. But this assumption does have some consequences. Um, and one of the things we can look at is sort of like the type of behavior that you're, uh, type of approximate posterior that you're trying to uh, optimize is if we're looking at uh, what would happen in, in a very, in sort of toy example. So let's imagine that we're going to approximate this um, uh, P of Z, which are, is here uh, shown by these green curves. So this is a, a correlated Gaussian in 2D. Um, and we're now going to try to fit um, a factorized QZ, which is factorized between Z1 and Z2, to this P of Z with this KL divergence, which is effectively what we're doing in variational inference. And then you see that because it's factorized, this Q of Z can't have any correlations among Z1 and Z2. And the property of this type of KL divergence is that it will sort of like uh, shrink such that it fits the smallest uh, uh, axis of variation. So this Q likes to sit um, inside P of Z such that it's not uh, non-zero in places where P is non-zero. So it likes to sort of like sit inside of P of Z. So this is what happens in variational inference. If you would do, if we would have started the other way around, so if we would have somehow said, okay, I actually want to fit Q to P in the other kubok library uh, divergence, then we would get this behavior that Q would like to cover all of uh, P of Z. So wherever um, P of Z is non-zero, Q, uh, Q has to be non-zero too. And you can see now that actually it has much larger variance uh, along this axis than it does, uh, than P uh, does. So conclusion here is that in variational inference, which is on the left side here, we tend to have uh, a lower variance estimate than the original posterior if we have a, if we have a um, restricted variational family. And this also happens when uh, P of Z, so the ground truth distribution is for instance multimodal. So here is a mixture of two Gaussians. So the uh, blue curves here are uh, the ground truth distribution that we're trying to fit. And if we take, again, the KL divergence that we are always considering in variational inference, um, and if we take two different initializations for Q of Z, then you see that you are going to end up in only one of the two modes of, uh, of P of Z. So if I initialize my Q close to this mode, I'm going to converge to having Q covering one of this, this mode. And if I initialize Q, to be close to the top right mode, I'll end up uh, here. If I would have not done variational inference, but for instance, another uh, method that optimizes the, this other reverse KL, uh, then I would have actually ended up with something that tries to cover both modes and uh, which then accidentally also has the highest mass in a very low density region. So here, this mode is not actually a good representative part of the distribution of P because it has a low density here. Um, so this is just um, to show the difference in behavior uh, of the consequence uh, of picking this type of KL divergence and not the other way around. Now there's, there's variational inference or variational inference like uh, methods that use a different divergence, for instance, an alpha divergence, which as a special case has these two uh, divergences in it. So this is an alpha divergence parameterized by this parameter alpha. And you can show that if you set alpha to minus infinity, uh, you get some a more extreme version of what we saw before, that Q actually picks one of the two modes and doesn't try to cover the other one. And alpha zero in here is actually a special case that we do with a uh, variational inference. And if you now set alpha as one, we have the other KL divergence. And if we even increase it more, we can see again that Q tries to cover all of the mass uh, of P. So, but just to remember, um, to, um, to, to summarize, in our case, in variational inference, we're here. So we try to, what happens is if we try to optimize a restricted family with respect to a very flexible distribution, we're going to basically try to cover only part of the modes and have a reduced variance compared to the actual posterior distribution.
So this is sort of like variational inference, let's say the basic variational inference. And now we're going to try to apply this to variational autoencoders. Um, and variational autoencoders, uh, of course, start from the concept of an autoencoder. So we're going to cover that briefly first. So just a deterministic autoencoder um, can be summarized as follows. And imagine that you have some data X, which on the left here is an example uh, uh, of this phase. Um, we're going to push it through a neural network that has a bottleneck in it. So if, for instance, X is d-dimensional, then this code or this hid hidden state is smaller as, as a lower dimensionality than the actual data. And then we're going to push it back through uh, another set of layers which where the output has the same size as the input. And a conventional autoencoder then basically tries to optimize a reconstruction loss such that this input and the output are approximately the same. Um, and then this bottleneck that we often have in an autoencoder uh, is called the code, which should be a compressed representation of the data. Um, so there, here an autoencoder is basically, in the previous slide, it was only used to sort of like have a representation, a compressed representation of the data. But autoencoders can also be used as generative models. And the way to do that, or the simplest way to do that, is to actually put a distribution on this code that we had before. So we're going to put a prior distribution on this um, and optimize an objective that takes into account this, this prior. And if we do that, we can actually generate more data because we can just take this prior, generate a sample from this code, and actually push it through the right half, the decoder part of the network, and what comes out are then, depending on the different samples that you draw, you get different output images after you've trained your uh, autoencoder. Um, and a particular type of autoencoder are the variational autoencoders, which were introduced in 2014 by uh, Dirk Kingma and Max Welling, and uh, in a um, concurrent paper by uh, Danilo Resende, uh, Shakir Mohammed, and uh, Dan Wierstra. And again, the, we start with a sort of like a, a joint model of only data and some latent variable, just like we did before in the variational inference case. So we say that we are going to model P of Z, which is some latent variable, and P of the data given that latent variable. And so in this case, we're going to actually model these two, two distributions with a neural network. Um, so we can model the probabilities of this random variable with a neural network or with just learnable parameters. And this um, decoder here can be represented by this neural network. So we take, for instance, as, that takes, for instance, as an input Z and outputs the probability parameters needed to produce an X. So this, in this case, is not really an autoencoder yet, uh, but we can get one by applying variational inference. Because what we would like to do in order to use this as a generative model is to optimize the log of P of X. Right? So if we have uh, data and we want to make sure that our marginal P of X produces nice data, then we're going to adjust our parameters theta such that log of P of X is optimized. And given this uh, decomposition between latent variables and observed variables, the exact objective would be just the log of this term where we marginalize over the random variable, the latent random variable Z. But this is not tractable, otherwise we wouldn't have had to do anything, all those things that we did um, with variational inference before. And exactly like in variational inference, we can then sort of like optimize a surrogate objective, which is the lower bound. So we can optimize, we can introduce this approximate posterior and then obtain again the evidence lower bound and optimize this alternative surrogate objective with respect to the uh, approximate uh, posterior and the model parameters theta. So now we still don't really have a, an autoencoder, but we have a variational objective to uh, uh, optimize this generative model for data where we have a neural network now in place just for the generative part of the model. So just for P of X given Z and potentially for P of uh, Z. Um, so Q of Z here is now the encoding distribution. So for a given X, it will uh, uh, sort of encode X into a latent variable set. Um, and now in order to make this an actual autoencoder, uh, we have to do something slightly different than what we've done before. We have to sort of amortize the variational inference. So, so far we've said 
we're going to optimize this objective, which is the evidence lower bound, with respect to the parameters of the generative model, so the decoder. And uh, so that's, that's over here. And we're going to try to find, for each data point, we're going to find a distribution Q, which is restricted to a certain family, such that this objective is also optimized. So in traditional variational inference, for each data point X separately, we'll find the optimal, optimal Q of Z. In amortized variational inference, we actually say, well, um, we're going to model Q of Z given X with a neural network. So we're going to say again that Q of Z given X still belongs to a family of distribution. So we could say Gaussian, but we're going to parameterize these uh, parameters of this distribution with a neural network. So we're going to say, take a neural network, which has parameterized parameters phi, give it an input, and that is supposed to, for instance, give you the mean and the variance of a Gaussian distribution, and that can then represent this Q of Z given X. So now our Q of Z given X, our approximate posterior, is uh, represented by a neural network, and we no longer have to do this, optimize this separately for each data point. Uh, so we've amortized the cost of inference by having one global network for it that takes as input X. So now if we look at the objectives that we have, we're no longer uh, going to optimize over say Q for every, this approximate posterior for every separate um, data point. We're actually just going to optimize over its neural network parameters phi. So now we're going to optimize this objective with two sets of parameters theta, which will be the parameters of the generative model, and phi, the parameters of the encoder model. And so what, to make this a bit more concrete, what's often uh, the case, and especially in the vanilla variational outcome encoder, is that we will pick this approximate posterior to be a Gaussian distribution. So Q, this family of approximate posteriors is going to be Gaussian, in this case, even factorized across dimensions. And that's determined by a mean and uh, a variance. And so we're going to have one neural network that predicts the mean as a function of the input and the variance and as a function of the input. Um, and so this is how this uh, Gaussian posterior can be amortized. And uh, the prior uh, that is very often used is actually the standard normal, so it doesn't have any learnable parameters. There's more, there's more work that doesn't do that, but in the, say, the vanilla case, this is a vanilla VAE case, this is usually used. Um, and so now we actually do have a variational autoencoder. Because before, as I said, before we were going to amortize this inference, we only had a decoder network and potentially a prior. But now we have uh, this approximate posterior that's also represented by a neural network. And so we now actually have um, an encoding distribution also represented by a neural network where you can imagine that this part of the network, the left part is the encoder network and the right part is the uh, decoder network. So now, because we are amortizing inference, we've actually created an autoencoder uh, with a variational uh, approximation for the encoder network. Um, so when we were talking about normal variational inference, we were always only approximate, we we're al always only considering optimization with respect to the approximate posterior. We were assuming that the generative model was fixed. And in variational autoencoder, we're actually optimizing both at the same time, right? So we're optimizing with respect to the generated parameters, theta, and we're optimizing with respect to the um, encoder or posterior parameters, phi. And um, because we're going to maximize this, um, we're going to actually be optimizing two quantities, which are both of interest for us. So the first is that we're actually approximately max maximizing, again, the log of the probability or the, the distribution of the generative model, right? So we've seen before that this term was the evidence lower bound as written here. And the difference between the log P of X and the elbow is this KL divergence, which is larger or equal to zero. So this is necessarily smaller than that. So if this term is a bit small, then this is a very fairly tight lower bound to that. So maximizing this will approximately try to maximize that term as well. So this will get us a good generative model. So that's, we're happy about that. Um, and because this log P of X, this log evidence doesn't depend on the encoder parameters, as, as we said before, optimizing this 
evidence lower bound ensures that this term also gets small. So we are both optimizing the log P of X, and that gives us a good generative model. And we're ensuring that the encoder actually approximates the intractable posterior that we were also interested in. So we are, we're basically doing uh, two things at the same time. Um, and now, of course, we actually have to optimize this. And it turns out that um, optimizing with respect to the generative model is fairly easy. So with the decoder and optimizing with respect to the um, encoder is a bit more difficult. So the reason, uh, so let's first go through quickly through the optimization of the um, generative model and, and, and see why that's so easy. And then we'll switch to the, uh, to the encoder model. So when you have the uh, generative model, we want to take the uh, gradient with respect to the uh, decoder parameters theta with respect to the elbow. So that's written out over here. So we take the gradient with respect to theta of the expectation of Q, which doesn't depend on theta, and then these two terms. And because this expectation doesn't depend on sort of like the probability that we're using to draw samples from doesn't depend on theta, we can just pull this gradient through and then take the gradient of these two terms separately and take a Monte Carlo estimate. So this is fairly straightforward, but hopefully you can already see that this gets a bit more difficult if we actually want to take the gradient with respect to phi, which is what we're actually trying to do if you want to optimize, for instance, with stochastic gradient descent, the parameters of the encoder at the same time. So now, if we again want to take this gradient with respect to phi, we are no longer allowed to just pull it through, right? Because the expectation here, the probability distribution also depends on phi. So in uh, the, say, the two original variational autoencoder papers by uh, Dirk Kingma and uh, Danilo Resende, both of these, uh, this trick of sort of like, this problem was circumvented with the so-called uh, reparameterization trick. And the trick here is to say, um, if we want to sample Z from Q of phi, so this approximate posterior, we can and differentiate through that sampling process. It's easier to do that if we basically write Z instead as a, a function, which we're going to determine in a second, it depends on the distribution Q of a random variable, epsilon, which does not depend on phi and does not depend on X. And if we do that, we can actually just uh, backpropagate through it because the randomness here is separated from the parameters that we're trying to optimize. So if that's the case, then for instance, let's say that we are trying to compute the gradient of phi with respect to uh, this term. So we take an expectation of Q, which again then depends on phi and some function f of z. Then we can just rewrite that as an expectations over the random variable epsilon, which doesn't depend on phi and f of z and write z here as a function of epsilon. And now we're allowed to pull it through. And now we can actually take the gradient as we can before. So this is called the reparameterization trick, and this will allow for just regular um, uh, backprop to be used. And there is this um, fairly recent introduction to variational autoencoders by Dirk Kingma and Max Welling that has a nice graphic to explain why this helps you to uh, be able to use, say, uh, backprop that we always use in, uh, in a neural network. So the original form that we had uh, is we had uh, a random variable Z, which was sampled from this distribution Q with parameters phi and condition on X. So this random variable is influenced by these two deterministic nodes, parameters phi and X. And that Z is then served as an input to some function F for which we would like to know the, uh, uh, the gradient with respect to phi. But because there's this sampling step, it's very hard to backpropagate through this. So if we can just basically take out the randomness and still have a deterministic path towards phi, then we can just use regular backprop. So that's what this uh, reparameterization trick does. Here it says Z is actually this deterministic function of phi, the input X and another random variable, epsilon, which we show over here, which doesn't depend on phi. And if we do that, we can just backpropagate through this path with regular uh, numerical backpropagation that most uh, uh, deep learning libraries have implemented for you. Um, right, so that's the reparameterization trick, quite a crucial part of the variational autoencoder. Um, and what we've just done for this random 
sort of like this, this arbitrary function f, we can then, of course, apply to the elbow. So what we're, we are trying to optimize is this evidence lower bound with respect to phi. Uh, and we wanted to take the gradient of this with respect to phi. And we can instead write this as an expectation over epsilon and write all of the z's as a function of epsilon, phi, and x. And now we can just pull the gradient through uh, without any issue. So here we can see this. We wanted to take the gradient. Uh, and it was originally on the left side of this, on the outside of this expectation, we can just, um, now we're allowed to pull it in and take gradients that we would uh, otherwise also be able to take and take a one Monte Carlo sample from this random variable epsilon. Um, so as I said, very often we use factorized Gaussian distributions and uh, that's one of the distributions for which you can do this reparameterization. Not all distributions allow for this, but imagine that we would take uh, as in the vanilla variational autoencoder, this approximate posterior, and we would factorize it across all dimensions of Z. Um, so each Z element of Z has its own mean and variance, which you could also say as writing uh, the distribution with a vector mu and a diagonal covariance matrix. Then you can reparameterize this by writing Z as mu plus sigma element-wise multiplied by this random variable epsilon, where epsilon is now just a standard normal, so it doesn't depend on mu and sigma. And mu and log sigma can be parameterized with an encoder neural network that takes as an input x and has parameters, uh, parameters phi. So this is for sort of like the standard VE. If you now wish to have a full covariance Gaussian, so no longer independent z, then there's also a reparameterization trick for this. Again, you sample z from the standard normal and uh, you now say z is mu plus a lower triangular matrix, uh, matrix multiplied with a matrix vector multiplied by this epsilon. And it turns out that this reparameterization trick is, uh, corresponds to having z sampled from this distribution where this covariance matrix is parameterized with the Cholesky decomposition. So this is L times L tr transpose. And so this sort of like first variational autoencoder paper uh, uh, by uh, Dirk Kingma and Max Welling showed that um, if you evaluate, if you optimize this model on MNIST and Frey faces for different uh, sizes of the latent variables, uh, that this model actually performs better than previous types of autoencoders uh, that had separate objectives for the encoder and the decoder, so-called wake-sleep autoencoders. Uh, uh, where here the red lines are the variational autoencoders and the green lines are the, uh, say, the baseline model with wake sleep and uh, higher is better. And they also inspected the latent space. So here what you can see are interpolations. So on the left column, for instance, we have faces. So fray fa the, one of the elements of, a, of the fray phase data set, you compute the Z, so the latent variable for that. And you take another one, another set of images here you compute that latent variable and interpolate between those and then generate the images that correspond to, uh, to those z's. And you can see that you can actually in sort of like interpolate faces. Uh, from left to right here seems to sort of correspond to a, a change in angle. Um, and you can also see a smile appearing here, for instance. And here you can do, have the same type of uh, figure with um, uh, MNIST digits that are interpolated in the latent space. Um, and then a concurrent paper by Danilo Rezende and Shakir Mohammed uh, also introduced uh, almost the same, uh, say, framework and also introduced a sort of like a, a better way to estimate the likelihood. So we said before that what we're trying to optimize is this evidence lower bound, and that's smaller or equal than the log evidence. So we could give that as a proxy for the log evidence to, to look at its performance. But we can have a, a tighter bound. Uh, that is basically that's closer to the log evidence if we do important sampling. So the way that works is that you draw multiple samples from your approximate posterior and you take sort of like a sum of these two ratios and, and averages inside the logarithm. Whereas what you would do in the evidence lower bound the, that we had in the VAE, the sum and the log are, uh, are switched. Um, and it turns out that by doing that, you're actually closer to the log P of X than if you were to do it this way. And this is also used later on in other uh, uh, importance weighted autoencoder that use this actually as an objective 
to optimize the model and not only to evaluate it. Um, and so this uh, other paper by Danilo Rosenda also has a variation around outer encoder and also showed that you can generate nice MNIST digits from this uh, variation of outer encoder as a generative model. And <clears throat> here they had a variation of outer encoder with 2D latent space and they tried to color the latents corresponding to the same uh, digit class. And so here you can see that there's some type of ordering in latent space or clustering with respect to uh, digit um, identity, even though the model doesn't actually know any of the, the labels. And so in the next two slides, I'll give like an incredibly incomplete selection of uh, advances in variation of autoencoders, but two papers that, uh, that I particularly like. Um, so fairly soon after like the, the original VAE papers, there was a paper called Ladder Variational Autoencoder uh, by Kasper Sonderby and his uh, colleagues, um, where the, um, the improvement was basically made on sort of hierarchical VAE. So what we've talked about so far is a model where we have observed variables X, a single latent variable, uh, and that's the encoder, and a single latent variable again, and the observed variable X, and that was the decoder. You can actually stack multiple layers of, say, these latent variables on top of each other, and that would give you a hierarchical variational autoencoder. But it turns out that these are really difficult to optimize, and adding more and more layers, um, even though theoretically it would give you a better model, in practice it, it tends not to happen. Um, and so what they did is they made a slightly different, they picked a slightly different inference model. So what you see on the left here is sort of like the graphical model for the um, the encoder, and they made some changes to that so that it reflects more the graphical model of the decoder model and has some shared parameters. And it turns out that that greatly benefited uh, performance. So what you see on the on the right here is the um, the train performance of the VAE. So the the say the the evidence lower bound as a function of the number of say Zs that I'm using here. And the original VAE here here is in red, and you can see that it doesn't actually benefit from more sets. Whereas if you choose this alternative um, graphical model for your um, um, encoder model, you actually do get better performance uh, when you add more and more layers of latent variables. And this is also reflected in the test score, and here they've actually computed the evidence lower bound uh, with this importance rating, which is a bit tighter, and you can see it shows the same behavior. And so recently, um, VEs, um, yeah, a lot of people are working on scaling VEs up because they're, if you look at the generative, sort of like the visual uh, quality of um, variational autoencoders as general, generative models, they tend to, if you're, if you're not careful, they tend to show uh, pretty blurry pictures. And this recent paper by NVIDIA, which proposed a nouveau VE, um, focused on improving the architecture of the encoder and the decoder of VAE such that you get actually high quality, high resolution uh, pictures. And this is one of these, uh, one of the first papers that shows that there's actually nice high quality, uh, um, yeah, that it's a good quality generative model and that it can do in that sense just as well or comparable to other generative models such as GANs. Um, so I want to now uh, talk a little bit about uh, sort of like a separate, um, direction of improvement for rational autoencoders, and that is to use normalizing flows to enable flexible posterior inference. So when we were talking about variational autoencoders, right, we said we are going to optimize this objective, uh, which is this evidence lower bound, and we were optimizing it with respect to the encoder parameters and the decoder parameters theta. And by doing so, we know that this encoder Q is going to approximate the intractable true posterior. Um, and we knew that the elbow is actually lower bounded, is lower bounding the log likelihood because of this difference of the KL. And so now you can imagine that if our goal is actually to optimize uh, log of P of X, and this term is very big, then this is not a very good lower bound. And this not, isn't not actually going to get us a good generative model. And the way you can sort of like visualize this is by imagining that this is the curve for the log likelihood for a fixed encoder. So we're going to take here a slice through the loss landscape where the encoder is fixed. Um, and as a function of the generative model, so the generative parameters theta, we're going to draw a log of P of X. 
And we know that the evidence lower bound is lower than that. And because in this case, we haven't really picked a very good uh, encoder, this gap between these two curves can be large. So what happens then is that if, if I were to optimize this evidence lower bound with respect to degenerative parameters, so theta, the optimum is not actually at the same spot as the optimum of the actual log likelihood. So if you're interested really in purely optimizing the log likelihood, it's important that this gap here is small. But this gap here can only be small if the encoder uh, distribution is very flexible, that it can actually properly match the uh, posterior that corresponds to a generative model. Um, and so one way to try to have a more flexible distribution than, for instance, only allowing for Gaussians is to uh, use normalizing flows for variational inference. So the way that that works is uh, you take a random variable, let's call it Z0, and we're making sure that Z0 is sampled from a distribution, which is simple in the sense that we can easily sample from it, and we can evaluate its density. So that's again for uh, you know simplicity pick uh, a Gaussian because that's tractable and easy to sample from. So now let's say that this Z0 is sampled from this Gaussian and it has, for instance, this, uh, this distribution. If I now apply a sequence of invertible functions to this, then what I'm effectively doing is I'm creating a sequence of random variables. So I start with Z0, right, which is uh, sampled from Q0. Then it's going to, um, going to apply one transformation F1. I'm going to get a new random variable, Z1, and so on. I'm going to have K random variables here. And because this F, all these, random, these, these transformations are invertible, you can actually write down the density of these intermediate and final random variables. So after each application of this function F, we're going to get a new random variable which is distributed and potentially distributed you know, in a correlated way, or it can be uh, multimodal, as you can see over here. And now, um, what's, uh, of course, important in variational inference is that if we're going to use this final random variable as our latent random variable, then we need to be able to know, to actually, to evaluate this density, because that's part of the objective that we're going to optimize. And it turns out that for each transformation, you can just use the change of variables formula, which says that if I would know the density of the previous random variable, then the density of the current random variable, Zk, is just that previous density corrected with a term that uh, um, tells you how much, uh, how it's sort of like a volume correction. So it tells you how much mass, how, mu how, many, how much you've stretched or squeezed or uh, the distribution. So this is just the determinant of the uh, Jacobian matrix of Zk uh, with the derivative with respect to Zk minus one. And this term can be a bit complicated. So of course we have to make sure that that's easy to calculate. But in general, if we then apply multiple sequences and we're interested in this density, we can just know the log density of the original easily tractable distribution, which we said was Gaussian, minus the sum of the logarithms of these determinants. And so this is basically all we need in order to be able to do uh, variational inference with normalizing flows. Of course, we want it to be practical, right? So ideally, we don't want to have a huge sequence of uh, transformations because that gets expensive. Uh, and we would like to have easily computable determinants. And so the first normalizing flow that was um, introduced was uh, introduced for variational inference was done uh, by uh, Danilo Rosenda and Shakir Mohammed in 2015. It was called planar flows, and it has this very simple form where we take a current random variable z, and we add this vector u. So here we've I've, I've tried to sort of like schematically picture it. So we have a random variable z, a learnable vector u, and we multiply this element-wise with this scalar, which consists of taking, for instance, a tan h function a learnable vector w, which is taking the inner product with, again, z again, plus b. So it turns out that this is actually um, not super flexible, but has a very similar, simple uh, Jacobian determinant. And the reason why this is not very flexible is because um, this, um, this type of network corresponds to a two-layer neural network with one single hidden unit. So you can imagine that that's not the most flexible one. I'm going to skip this for a moment. You just have to believe me that if you want to write down this Jacobian determinant, you can make use of this 
matrix determinant lemma, uh, which will give you, uh, say, this uh, a density, which is very easy to compute and doesn't scale uh, cubically with the dimension of Z, which would be the case for any transformation, an arbitrary transformation. So it turns out that this can actually nicely match densities. So what you see over here are some example densities. And here you can see flows, a set of flows that are matched with it, uh, planar flows that are matched with it. And you can see that if you have up to 32 flows, you can do a reasonable, uh, you can reasonably match the original density. Um, but as I said, this is not very flexible. Uh, so we have a lot of transformations that are necessary here, but it has an easily computable determinant. Um, so there is a uh, follow-up work uh, by Dirk Kingma and, and, and some of his colleagues where there is a more flexible transformation. They designed a more flexible one where you now take this random variable Z, the previous random variable, and you multiply it element-wise with the vector sigma, uh, which depends only on the, uh, say, Z1 to I minus one. And you have a similar structure for mu. And this will give you uh, you can write this as the inverse of an autoregressive transformation. So if I would now know Z prime, and if I want to know Z, so my first random variable, that would actually give you an autoregressive transformation. This determinant also is very simple, and this is much more flexible. So uh, this no longer corresponds to uh, a neural network with a single uh, neuron in the middle, uh, but it has, uh, say, better, uh, it's much more flexible. So this is more flexible and it has uh, easily computable determinant. Um, some other work that I worked on was try to generalize planar flows in a different way. So when we had um, planar flows, we could write it, we could visualize it like this, right? Where U and W were learnable parameters. Of course, this will be more flexible if you would just write matrices here and make this a matrix vector multiplication. And this again, a matrix vector multiplication. Turns out this is not really always Invertible, you have to do something particular to these matrices, A and B. Um, if you do that though, uh, you can write this as a, a, compared to planar flows, which has this bottleneck in it, you can write this as a, a two layer neural network with a, a larger bottleneck, which you can vary yourself as a hyperparameter. So um, you have to do something to, this, to these two matrices to make this invertible and to have an efficient determinant. Um, and so the trick here tends to be that you pick A and B as QR decompositions uh, and that you use Sylvester's determinant lemma, which is generalization of the matrix determinant lemma. Um, so this, just like inverse autoregressive flows, gives you flexible transformations and has easily computable determinants. But there is one difference which is also turning out to be important, and that is uh, that it amortizes the inference in a different way. So we have... Uh, as we said before, in normal inference, we have uh, our family of distributions Q, and we're going to optimize Q, and we have a generative model P that we're going to optimize. And in normal variational inference, we say, we optimize Q for every data point separately. And in amortized inference, we said, okay, we're going to actually parameterize Q with a, the approximate posterior with a neural network. And now there's a paper, which is actually a really nice paper by uh, Chris Kramer in 2018, that says actually this gap that we were talking about between the log evidence and the evidence lower bound uh, is, in the case of amortized inference, influenced by two things. First, the restriction of this family, right? If this is not very flexible, you're definitely always going to have a, a gap. But the second gap comes from the fact that you're amortizing, so that you're actually picking a, uh, a neural network that is supposed to give you the, do the inference for all uh, random variable, for all inputs at the same time. If that network is not very flexible as a function of X, then you're actually going to do worse than if you would not to do amortized inference, but just variational inference with this family. So, um, and for when you're doing this for, uh, for normalizing flows, um, let me visualize it this way. What happens in some normalizing flows is that you have the input X, which influences the first distribution, but all the parameters of the transformations are not made dependent on X. So the only way that X here influences this chain of distributions is through the first distribution. Whereas if you make sure that the parameters of the normalizing flow, so for instance, the mean and the scale in IIF or the inverse autoregressive flows or the A and the B matrices in uh, Sylvester flows, then you can actually influence also the type of transformations that you're doing for each data point. And that is 
well, necessarily more flexible. And this turns out to be a fairly crucial component. Um, and now finally, I want to briefly mention uh, some normalizing flows as standalone generative models. Um, I'm hoping I can do that within five minutes. I'll be quick so we can have some time for some more questions. Sorry about that. Um, so um, imagine that you now just have a normalizing flow and we just view it as taking an initial random variable, Z0, and applying, again, this sequence of transformations. If we now associate this last random variable with the actual data, then we can just, without having a variation or autoencoder, use this sequence of transformations plus this initial density to have a model that tries to compute the density over this data that we had before. But what you need for this is the actual inverse, which we've, even in the case of variational, variational inference, ensured must exist, but it doesn't need to be easily computable. And in this case, if you want to use the normalizing flow as a standalone generative model, no variational inference, uh, you have to make sure that this is easily computable because the way you optimize this model is you take a data point X, and you push it through the inverse of all transformations, then you get Z0 and you make sure that Z0, uh, the density of Z0 corrected by all these Jacobian determinants uh, is optimized because that's the actual log likelihood. Um, and so one of the say, most elegant and simple normalizing flows that's used this way is uh, uh, real NVB, which stands for uh, real non volume preserving uh, flows, uh, which has this very nice simple structure. If you go from the direction of data to latent, you take, for instance, X. So this, let's make this picture, this data point is X. We split it into two. We do nothing to the first part. And the second part, we scale. And that scale is, is a function of the first part. And we translate it. And that translation is also part of the first part, a function of the first half that's not transferred. The inverse here is actually very simple. Uh, so going in both directions, we can sample from it easily and we can optimize it easily. And um, these two scales make sure that the Jacobian determinant is not one, and that's why it's called non-volume preserving. So it turns out that you know, producing images with this actually worked at the time pretty well. Um, there's been some follow-up work of other types of work that, are, are, uh, that use normalizing flows like this, but that have a slightly different structure. So there's massed autoregressive flows, which takes um, data in the direction of data to latent, makes an autoregressive transformation. So that's quite slow at sampling time. But at training time, when we want to optimize just the log likelihood, we go in this direction. So from latent, uh, sorry, from data to, to latent. Uh, and that's not autoregressive. So that's parallel. So training is actually very fast and only uh, sampling is a bit slow. This is a bit more flexible. Uh, and there is, in 2018, Dirk Kingma and uh, uh, Raful Dariwal uh, published uh, GLOW, which showed that uh, if you scale up models like real NVP, and if you add a new type of invertible layer with one, one by one convolution, so basically you view a one by one convolution as a matrix multiplication, and you ensure that this matrix is invertible, then you can actually get high resolution uh, generated, generated images with this uh, with flows, and this was one of the first papers that showed that you can actually have good quality, uh, say, pictures with this. Now there's some, there's a lot of normalizing flow uh, work. I want to basically highlight two more, and then I'll uh, I'll call it quits for today. Um, so there's some flows for discrete random variables. So what we were talking about before it usually uh, discusses flows for random variables that are continuous, so they're real valued. There's two papers. Uh, discrete flows and integer discrete flows, where um, in both cases they're considering discrete data, but they're slightly different. So in the discrete flow paper, you have discrete but not ordinal data with a finite number of classes. And in the integer discrete flows, we assume that we have ordinal discrete variables. So an example would be here to pick random variables that are one, two, three, four, where you, where you actually have three and four are closer to each other than one. And text, for instance, or letters are not ordinal. And so on the, the discrete flow paper, we have text generation as a focus. And on the integer discrete flow, we had source compression. Um, and they have slightly different variants in uh, how they actually construct their architecture for the flow models. And the final thing I want to mention, which is also very exciting, is normalizing flows that are actually parameterized by an ordinary differential equation. 
So what we've looked at so far is we've looked at a sequence of random variables that takes like a finite sequence. We have set zero to set K. So this is a K layer flow. If you would view this as infinitesimal steps, you can take like an infinite sequence of random variables. If you were to parameterize this with an ordinary differential equation like this. Um, and where we have to change the variables normally to compute the log likelihood, and we have to compute this determinant, which can be fairly inefficient. If you were to parameterize it with an uh, ordinary differential equation, we uh, actually only have to compute the trace of this Jacobian. Uh, and that can be more efficient, which is of course is uh, traded off by the fact that you have to actually solve this differential equation with a ODE solver. Um, so the, a few of the, I mean, I've definitely not given all the references to all normalizing flow work, but a few of the references that I like to use for reading up on this are Variational Inference, a review for statisticians by David Bly. Uh, this recent introduction by variational autoencoders, uh, I like very much. And there's a big overview paper by uh, George Papamakarios uh, and other of his co-authors on normalizing flows. Um, so if you're interested in that, I suggest that that's a good source uh, for further information. That's all I have to say. <laughs>